Okay, good morning and welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about union stations, both with the big U union stations and little U union stations. So one common fixture of American rail travel, these before Amtrak, that people generally know about are the union stations. Most major cities across the country there had a union station or at one point in its history had a union station. And um, there also were fairly smaller towns and minor cities that also had union stations if they tended to be near the um, crossroads of major railroads. The bigger ones, on the other hand, were generally grand stations that were or are an architectural gem of the city that it served and was an anchor point for the city's downtown. These union stations and the little U union stations as I'm going to be referring to them as came about for generally three reasons which include the intervention of local government, monopolization of the industry, and the scarcity of good real estate. And um, in this I will go over about four examples or so from around the U.S. which will include Denver Union Station, LA Union Station, King Street Station in Seattle, and the major stations of Chicago both current and former or at least just in general. So the first major reason reason why union stations were built was due to a lack of real estate in certain hub cities. For example, Denver Union Station was built under the leadership of the Union Pacific and the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy and their various subsidiaries. This was done in part because Denver was a small city at the time and there was less space for a large terminal near downtown or at least multiple large terminals near downtown for the various railroads and their multiple subsidiaries. So to handle this in 1881, the Union first Union Station was opened and was built for a cost of just over a half a million dollars. And that was in 1880s money, not um, 2020's money. And this station after at some point burned down during its you know life as a station due to a fire and in a hotel room. The current station was opened in 1914 and after various renovations over the, and has had various renovations over the year including um, one of the more recent ones in the 2000s under the Fast Tracks program or was it before Fast Tracks? Anyways it was an RTD program, um, RTD I guess Denver program that um, renovated the station and made it as it currently is and prepared it for the um, its current life as a commuter rail hub or I guess regional rail because it's not really commuter rail. Anyways, different video. <laughs> At a tight between the world wars, Denver Union Station saw over 80 trains per day from the railroads that used the station. And these railroads were the Union Pacific, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, the Santa Fe, the Rock Island, and the Rio Grande, and all their various subsidiaries. Another common feature of Union Station, and Denver's in particular, um, at least for this video, <laughs> was that it had transit connections between other forms of transportation, most notably the interurban and the streetcars. Denver Union Station had a connection with the Denver and Interurban Railroad, which was owned by the Colorado and Southern, which was a Burlington subsidiary. Transit connections are important because prior to the 1950s, cars weren't the primary form of transportation and most people had to travel by other means, which was usually foot or train, and buses as, as time went on, and little soapbox. Yeah, transit connections between different modes of transportation is very important because they feed on each other. So not only do you need to have like a good like rail service, but you also need to have like a good feeder bus network to get people around and to use them. So, and this was something that people back then understand, so we need to start doing that more now, which some places do and some places don't, but again, story for a different video. So moving on to the next type of union stations, which are the ones that were built by the railroad industry because it was a little bit monopolistic. And in some ways it still is, but in different ways, and that's again, different story altogether. We're not really getting into this, um, at least that um, aspect today, but we're getting into more of the 20th century uh, monopolization and corruption and, you know, ways of skirting the legal system. One major example is King Street Station in Seattle. This also brings us to the topic of Little U Union stations, which I will touch on briefly, but by Little U Union Station, I am referring to stations that were Union stations but weren't called Union Station. At one point in the 1880s, the Great Northern, Northern Pacific and the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy were all owned under the auspices of James J. Hill, and by 1890s, the Northern Pacific and Great Northern had both reached Seattle. And until 1904, they both terminated at what was essentially a warehouse because Hill was more interested in increasing the profits of the combined railroads and didn't think pastures needed a fancy terminal station. But his mind changed after the Union Pacific and the Milwaukee Road built their Union Station, which was Seattle Union Station, which in the picture I will throw up will be in the background. <laughs> Um, of modern King Street Station, and it was and um, to compensate for this, the um, Great Northern and Northern Pacific built King Street Station literally across the rails from the Union Station, and this station was built between 1904 and 1906, and it is actually still in use today, and it's Amtrak's main terminal in um, Seattle. The Union Station, I believe, now is the um, local transit authority's headquarters and isn't used as a train station because if you can't see, there there is a highway over where where the tracks used to be. <laughs> Because uh, it's America for you. <laughs> Pay of paradise to put up a parking lot and, you know, got rid of trains to make room for cars because that's, that's a 
normal thing we do in America. So even though the station was built by two quote unquote separate railways, the railways that built them were effectively owned by the same people, but because they were separate, it was still technically a union station, and which is why it's on this list. And it's also one of the ones that are still in use today. Okay, and one of the last main reasons why union stations were built were when the city government got involved. This happened in Los Angeles and Chicago with significantly less thorough results, but more on that in a in a minute. Originally, there were three stations in Los Angeles. The Southern Pacific had Arcade Station, the Santa Fe had La Grand Station, and the Union Pacific used a Victorian-style station. The Southern Pacific and Union Pacific eventually consolidated their operations into a station called Central Station in 1924. In 1911, the city of Los Angeles, not the not the train that I was talking about recently, but the city itself, issued a study to consolidate all rail travel into one station. The railways were hesitant, but the State Rail Commission released its own report in 1920 about the consolidation of LA's railroad stations. This report actually was fought all the way up to the Supreme Court, and in 1931, the Supreme Court actually ruled against the railroads, and by early 1932, the railroads had agreed to the basic design and location of Union Station, but still continued to, continue to drag their feet until June a year later, and the station was officially opened in 1939. Also, I do have to note that this came after the Long Beach earthquake in 1933, which damaged the dome of Legrand Station. So that also was a slight impetus to getting you know their act together on consolidating all the terminals, as well as public the public voting to consolidate the rail terminals in 1926. All that just kind of pushed it along. And LA Union Station is actually still used today and is owned by the city of Los Angeles. And um, although I don't really. Um, it's one of the few reasons I actually have to go visit Los Angeles because it is still used to this day by Amtrak and Metrolink and um, I guess LA Metro because they do have their light rail lines and I think a subway line running through there. So it's still used to this day and is uh, one of the, it is also known as the last of the great rail stations to be built since it was the last opened. And um, I don't believe any grander union stations were open after the war. I mean, there could be some in other parts of the country because I'm not omnipotent and uh, never will claim to be. And Chicago is another city that is well known for its train terminals. At its peak, there were six rail terminals in Chicago. Um, these were Union Station, which is still used by Amtrak and Metro, Dearborn Station, Northwest Terminal, LaSalle Street Station, Central Station, and Grand Central Station. Northwestern Terminal was primarily served by the Chicago and Northwestern Railway and is still served by Metro to this day. Union Station was um, primarily served by the Milwaukee Road, the Burlington Route, and the Pennsylvania Railroad. Dearborn Station, on the other hand, was primarily served by the Santa Fe, and um, the station building is now a office building, and the rail yards were turned into a park. LaSalle Station, LaSalle Street Station, I think it was LaSalle Street, don't quote me on that, was primarily served by the New York Central and Rock Island. Central Station was primarily served by the Illinois Central, and the station has since been demolished. And finally, Grand Central Station, which was served by the Baltimore, Ohio, Ohio, the Great Chicago and Great Western, and the Sioux Line, and of course all of these stations, with the possible exception of Northwest Terminal, were served by a bunch of smaller railroads beyond the ones mentioned. And the four of these stations were little union stations because multiple railroads used them. Actually, I think I actually think that's five if I can count because there were technically six. There are also plans to consolidate the six stations in Chicago down to four, but the only thing that came out of this was the building of union stations. But <laughs> the total still remained at six because if put it bluntly, like general. Generally, I'm assuming what happened in LA happened in Chicago, which was the rail are like, oh hell no, we're not going to consolidate down into like six stations. Silver lining is, is that Chicago Union Station is now the only station that handles inner city train traffic, which was one of the dreams of the people who designed it. And um, part of that is just the sad reality that there's far fewer trains in this country than there used to be. But you know, hey, Union Station is now actually the only inner city rail station in Chicago. So fun quirks of history. And one of the reasons why Union Stations were so grand was down to how many railways would contribute to these projects. If three rail railways were contributing to a terminal, they could afford to build a grand station, even if they couldn't afford to do that on their own, which is the thing that happened in Chicago. Many smaller railroads would have space in the far grander stations than they would building their own, and since they wouldn't be building a big station on their own, you know, for four trains a day, um, that meant that they could have their four trains a day coming in at like a platform, and then they'd still be in a much nicer station, even if they're sharing it with their rivals and possibly competitors. And it would also just make for through trains easier, which also increased business, which was just a um, way of growing business. Like for example, uh, there was a time when pretty much every train that came from the East Coast into Chicago had through trains onto trains heading West. Beat sharing a station was just made that far easier. And usually you would um, 
have through cars with the trains that connected at whatever station you terminated in in Chicago because that was just convenient. And one final point on this is that not every railroad using a union station would necessarily own a share in the joint company that owned the station. Sometimes railways would just rent space in a station, which happened um, in Chicago a lot because, um, of course, it did because it's Chicago. And I think, um, what was it, Dearborn, which is the one that was used by the um, Santa Fe, I believe they were the sole owners of that station and they just basically just rent, rented space out to other railways on an as needed basis. And um, post the creation of Amtrak, Amtrak did kind of hermit crab into some of these stations over time, um, but Amtrak itself never really built any grand stations. It at most, I think, built Amshacks. And the nicer stations that do exist within the Amtrak system now are generally either the city got involved and built a new station because they needed it, basically anywhere in California would be a good example of, one, of doing this, of either the A, they built a new station, or a, they built a new one, or B, they just renovated the existing stations and made them nicer and expanded them if need be, which is, again, a very um, big um, thing that happened in California. Hopefully, I'll throw in pictures of, like, um, maybe either Oakland, Oakland's Jack London Square Station or Emeryville and, San, and Sacramento and San Jose's um, stations, because those are the better better example of doing this, of um, Sacramento and San Jose, of just restoring the old station and making it better, and um, Emeryville and Oakland of building new stations to serve the new um, services, although those last two were built because of Loma Prieta, knocking, not knocking down the old Oakland station, but damaging it beyond, I believe it was the city's or Amtrak's desire to repair it or their ability to repair it. Um, so anyways, we're going to leave that there, and this has been your brief whirlwind tour on Union Stations and why they existed and what they did and all other fun stuff. So hopefully you did enjoy, and um, I will see you in the next one. The next one's going to be railroad-driven tourism. So uh, look forward to that one. It will be hopefully fun. <laughs> At least it's been kind of fun for me to research. It'll probably be much longer than the last three that I just made. So yeah, look forward to much longer, hopefully denser content because it's taken me a while to research. And that's kind of one of the reasons why the last few videos have been kind of short. Needed some few shorter videos to do while I was making longer ones. And otherwise, um, before I keep rambling, do the like, share, subscribes, leave me comments, get mad at me, be nice to me in the comments. Doesn't really, um, I don't know. The algorithm likes it either way if you're engaging. So I will just see you then and stop rambling.